I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. My guest this week is Anne Handley. So I think the first thing is to really understand what is voice? Like, what do we actually mean by that? It sounds so high-minded. It sounds like something very literary. But essentially, all it means is, how do you sound when a reader comes to your website, for example, or when they come to your social channels, or when they come to the landing page for this podcast? What do your words project to them? Like, what kind of picture do they paint in the mind of that customer or prospect? reader who's accessing that material. Anne Handley is a Wall Street Journal best-selling author focused on helping businesses worldwide escape marketing mediocrity to ignite tangible results. Her work has appeared in Entrepreneur, The Wall Street Journal, NPR, Chicago Public Radio, and The Financial Times. IBM named her one of seven people shaping modern marketing. More than 50,000 people subscribe to her popular email newsletter. She is the world's first chief content officer, a principal at training and education company Marketing Profs, and a regular speaker at events globally. My interview with Ann Handley is coming right up, but first... As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful manner. On LinkedIn, you'll have access to and build relationships with Decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C level executives. You'll also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn Ads is also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash mpn. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, it's Jason Falls of the Marketing Podcast Network. You know we're trying to bring you the greatest education opportunities out there. We've got another one for you, folks. The Creator Economy Expo, CEX 2023, is for content creators and entrepreneurs interested in building and growing their content-first businesses without relying on social platforms. This year's Creator Economy Expo features 10 amazing keynote speakers and over 30 in-depth breakout sessions. Join 500-plus bloggers, podcasters, authors, newsletter writers, speakers, coaches, and consultants, and free freelancers at the learning and networking event for content creators. Don't be left out. Plan to attend this year, May 1st through the 3rd, 2023 in Cleveland, Ohio. Register now and get early bird pricing and the Marketing Podcast Network has a special offer for you. You can get $100 off using the coupon code MPN100. That's MPN100. Head over to CEX.events to register. CEX.events code MPN100. Anne Handley, welcome to On Brand. Well, thank you, Nick Westergaard. And, you know, I have to say, I really enjoy your podcast voice. I don't think I've ever heard it quite so up close and personal before. Well, you were you were probably a, a, a guest within the first hundred. And I was just editing uh, episode 448 this morning. Whoa. So Whoa. so I'm sure that I've settled into uh, into whatever whatever this podcasting voice is but i i feel like i could yeah i feel like i could roll out of bed and uh and and host a podcast somewhere you should actually you know you should you should do that you should basically you know like a uh you should call your day like a nick westergaard alights from his bed his his feet hit the floor and what is he doing yes he is walking walking toward the bathroom Oh, this is this is this is fun. This makes me think of uh, a appropriately a writerly reference because one of my one of my favorite uh, books and movies about writing uh, is is Wonder Boys, and uh, there's there's a scene where a young author in that. Uh, is drunk, and his his way of being drunk is uh, is to narrate 
uh, like what's happening to him and, and, you know, he's trying to get to the bathroom, but will he make it? So, <laughs> I like it. You should try it. I, I, yeah, just, uh, just, just podcast everything. See, my assumption is that I always talk like this, but maybe, mm, no. maybe, well, maybe I yeah, don't. no, not at the beginning. At the beginning, you definitely had a, it's a fuller, richer <laughs> version of Nick Westergaard. This this was what you signed up for to 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 spend uh you know thirty minutes or so talking about my voice. That's yes. that's that's what most of these are. You that that might have been the other thing that changed in the in the in the several hundred since last you were on the show. Really mm. less about branding and more about uh the the sound of my voice. Well, well it is your show. So. It it is it is you know there's that's 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 the state of content these days. You have to go. You have to really have an angle. So uh, that's that's how I've chosen to uh, escape marketing mediocrity. <laughs> and uh, as as your bio notes, I, I feel like you've done a really good job of kind of positioning your worldview uh, with, you know, because again, you were the first chief content officer, you know, the the one of the you know, architects of content marketing. But I feel like over the past few years, it's really become about kind of this uh, this problem in 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 content marketing. So how did that how did that 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 worldview come to be in terms of of what you're seeing and and what you want to do about it? Mm, so by the worldview, you mean the the slippery slope toward mediocrity. Is that what? Yeah. Mean? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I, I guess it's, I, I feel like the mediocrity has always been there. I don't know that it's gotten more profound over, you know, the past couple of years. Um, I mean, I have to think about that. Has it? I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's funny, Nick, because, you know, my worldview is very much about, lifting brands up, right? Lifting people up. So like somebody asked me the other day, you know, what's the, what's the biggest mistake we make in writing? Like I get that a lot when I do interviews and like, scratching, I scratching that off the list of questions. Yeah, there you go. Is that number three or four? <laughs> yeah, okay. We're about to keep talking for a little bit. I've lost my place. Ask me that in yes. your, in your very robust voice. Um, and I hate questions like that because, you know, it, it automatically sets up the listener on the defensive. And it, it, I also think that it suggests that there is a right way and a wrong way to write. And I'm not about that. Like, I'm not about making people feel terrible for their writing ability or their lack thereof or their mediocre content or their lack thereof. Um, it's really, a, in my mind, about lifting people up and, and empowering brands and businesses and marketers to produce better stuff, or at least be able to recognize it, being able to recognize a good story and good writing and engaging content. At least if you can do that, then I think we're we're part of the way there. So that tends to be my worldview about things. And I guess that's what I seek to do about it is to empower people, to lift people up and to let them know that, you know, we are all capable of ridiculously good, which is why my book is called Everybody Writes. It's not called A Handful of Us Write. Or everybody writes except you. It's everybody. Literally everyone is capable of ridiculously good writing. And that is is truly not only my my positioning, I guess, or my branding, but it's it's ultimately it's what I believe. It's it's my belief system. Well, and that I was I was thinking the same thing with with your approach and and with your book, uh, which I was uh, for the bio reading from the 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 bio in the in the book jacket flap but it i i need to mention also it is a, the new and improved completely revised and expanded everybody writes but i i forget sometimes because it you know it's easy to to glaze right over a, a title and 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 what it means and i think that's that's a really important thing that you just noted as well because i feel like with writing especially we have a lot of baggage and I always just for shorthand call it like the English teacher stuff that we're, we're kind of 
kind of primed for thinking kind of what you said of of we're wrong and i think that's why talking about it and and how you talk about it to to your point just now is is really key too because i think it can be a a turnoff for anybody even even considering doing anything better or different when it comes to their writing yes yes we do have a lot of baggage sometimes it's trauma from a teacher sometimes it's trauma from an adult sometimes it's self-imposed trauma you know just feeling like you are somehow inadequate at grammar like i hear that a lot yeah people think that they're terrible writers very often what they mean is i'm bad at grammar and i just want to dispel anybody here who's feeling like yeah you know it's me it is not you it's i think we all have this sort of niggling sense of that and it's because i mean we can we can unpack the the educational system if you wish at this point but i feel like <laughs> a, a lot of it has to do with the way that we're taught um and so yes i do seek to dispel that that very much um and by the way that's actually part of the reason why i wrote the the second edition of everybody writes that new and improved edition is because i wanted a book about writing to be fun to read. Like the the first one sold very well, you know, it's done very well. But when I went back and read it, it didn't have the right kind of tone for me. You know, I felt like I wanted it to feel like a fun romp through writing. I wanted it to feel like a book that you would want to read. And so I tried to incorporate a whole lot more fun and, and joy in the second edition than I did in the first edition. And that's actually why I completely rewrote the whole book. I didn't just, you know, run a quick vacuum over it and, and give it a light dusting. I actually like went in, I, I, I like stripped it right down to the studs and I rebuilt it from the, from the basement up because I wanted it to feel different. I wanted it to read differently. Um, and a lot of that has to do with a, not only an empowering kind of vibe, but it has to do with the tone too, like the, the lighthearted tone the feeling that, wow, you know, this is actually a really fun, fun book. And that's why I wrote the 10% funnier as, you know, it's right on the cover there. Um, in part because I wanted it to, I wanted to signal, you know, this is a, a fun read. Um, and I wanted people to be intrigued by, huh, how could a, write, a book on writing be 10% funnier? Notice, by the way, that it's just 10%. It's not 47%. Or no, 70%. yeah, yeah. Now it's a yeah. very low bar. Um <laughs> Quick side story, I I only mentioned because I think you'll appreciate. So I was reading an interview with Malcolm Gladwell, and he was talking about how he has never written a shouts and murmurs um, article for or or piece for the New Yorker magazine, which he contributes articles to frequently. But he's never written a shouts and mur murmurs humor piece because he doesn't like the fact or he doesn't want to set himself up for failure in the eyes of the reader because when you read the shouts and murmurs yeah. column, which is a humor column automatically you're like this was not as funny as i <laughs> think a shouts and murmurs piece in the new yorker should be and he his whole thing is like i don't want to signal that this is funny i just want to surprise the reader with some humor and unfortunately i read that after the 10 percent funnier was already on the book jacket <laughs> and I thought, damn it but you know what? I think 10% is just enough. Like I've, I've now come around full circle and, and I thought, all right, Malcolm, that's for you. But I think the 10% is low enough that it doesn't feel like I'm setting myself up. That's I, I love that. And I can I, knowing you uh, just a little bit, I can imagine after after hearing that of uh, of of trying to get that uh, that that book jacket back. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. Driving to the Amazon warehouse, yeah. <laughs> just shoveling them into the into my vehicle. And Where'd they go? Away. Yeah. Where'd they all go? They were just a minute ago what? on that planet over there. What happened? Well, you 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 took my reference about taking it down to to the studs uh, because it really is. It's funny. I was just getting it down to to be a lazy podcaster and read a bio from a book jacket, which is is not my first time uh, doing that. Uh, but I got it down and and was looking at it compared to the other one, which uh, the first edition, which I I have there as well, and it is. 
I mean, boy, it's a substantially different book in terms of 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 size. But I think especially when we talk about things digital and and books about things digital, a lot of times when there are new editions, uh, the dated stuff is taken out. Uh, the new social networks and forms of content are plugged in, and and like you said, it's kind of a a, a, a dusting. Uh, but that's a bigger undertaking. So, how how did you start? What are what are the studs of 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 a book? Mm, that's a good question. So, the studs of this book was it like table of contents, or did even that have to go? Yeah, no, the studs are are the table of contents. But I should say that not only did I take it down to the studs, but I also put an addition on the back because <laughs> the okay, studs. Good. There, there are more studs in this edition than the previous edition. This metaphor is just getting weirder by the second. I was going to say, just as long as we keep talking about all the studs in your book, I think yeah, we're going to be fine. Yeah, in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the first edition, I think had, oh my gosh, I should have looked this up. I think it had six parts. This one has seven. And so I added a, another lally column and, and added, added a, uh, a sunroom on the back. Also installed a bouncy house, by the way, just for that 10% funnier piece of it. Um, but yeah, I, so the, the, in terms of like, you know, kind of what stayed, like what, what are the studs in this book? It's the, the, the sections of the book remained. So the first part is talking about, um, you know, sort of writing rules as I see them. The second part, grammar and usage. The third part, voice, which is a brand new section. That's the new alley column in the edition on the back. Um, in the first edition, I barely talked about voice. It was maybe a, a, a chapter or two, but in this one, I have a whole section about it because my thinking on it has has evolved. Um, in the fifth or sixth edition, uh, sorry, fifth or sixth section, uh, sixth, I have um, I talk about things marketers write, like things that we tend to publish as businesses, as brands. So, for example, things like um, email and home pages and about us pages and landing pages and headlines and uh, what else? Um, social media, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff. In the first edition, there were 13 things, as I identified, that most businesses tend to create and produce. In this new edition, there are 20 things. And why is that? Well, of course, it's because as our world has evolved as technology has evolved. We have more opportunities, number one. But number two, like my thinking has evolved. So in the first edition, you know, my section on writing for email was pretty slim. I think it was maybe, you know, just a couple of pages. In this new edition, I talk about direct response email. I talk about why you need an email newsletter. I talk about how to write an email newsletter in a way that is going to actually move the needle for your business. Um, and so there's a lot of things that I, I blew out, you know, in addition to remodeling, right? So, you know, taking each section and thinking about what's, what's changed, what hasn't. Now, that said, I also took some stuff out. So, for example, in the first edition, I had a whole piece on readability. And I was like, oh, my God, number one, that is like so boring. When I read it, I was like... <laughs> I was like in a stupor. I was drooling, Nick. I was like, not in a good way. I was just like, oh my God, this is <laughs> terrible. Um, it was all about like Fleisch Kincaid readability scores. Yeah. And I was like, ugh, why did I do that? So I um, I took that right out because, you know, uh, no one's going to look, nah, no one needs that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you just don't. So I do have, I moved the readability tools section to the end, uh, part seven, which is, you know, helpful tools and resources, but we don't need to talk about it for pages on end. And we don't need the whole history of Rudolf Fleisch and how he came up with a Fleisch Kincaid uh, readability score. It was like, you know, interesting to me, but probably not to anybody else. So that's the kind of thing where I just really thought I, I sort of slipped on the skin of the reader, um, as gross as that might sound, but I really tried to get inside the head of the reader and think, what do they really need to know in 2023? What is truly helpful? You know, if I'm a new content marketer, or even if I'm a seasoned content marketer, I'm looking to, you know, kind of infuse my writing and my content with, um, with some, some, uh, you know, new personality, or if I want to refresh things at all, like, what do, what would I be thinking about? What do I really need to know? Um, so I think that's what I really tried to do is to think about things 
almost obsessively from the mindset of the reader. I did that to some degree in the first edition, but in the second edition, I got a little bit, um, I got, I got pretty deep into that. On Brand, we'll be right back after this. Hey there, it's Jason with the Marketing Podcast Network. Real quick, I want to make sure you know that the world's leading B2B marketing expo is returning to the Los Angeles Convention Center on March 21st and 22nd. It's high time we got back together to learn, see the latest technologies and solutions, and network, right? Join thousands of marketing professionals just like you to learn from over 250 industry expert speakers, educational masterclasses, and over 300 exhibitors. And this year, your ticket also gets you into the Sales Innovation Expo and the Marketing and Advertising Expo. So it's like three conferences in one. It's March 21st and 22nd at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Go to b2bmarketingexpo.us to register. That's b2bmarketingexpo.us. The Marketing Podcast Network is a proud partner of the B2B Marketing Expo for 2023. We'll see you in LA. As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful manner. On LinkedIn, you'll have access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You'll also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads is also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Now, back to the show. I want to talk more about brand voice because you're one of my my go-tos there when when I talk about it and I love the idea of, you know, the your your logo test that I reference a lot in terms of if it sounds like you. And that's usually a pretty telling test. But uh, like like any test that doesn't come out the right way, we've switched metaphors now. It's much more alarming. Um, what what do you want to what what can you do about that if you look at that and and you're writing it doesn't sound any different uh, in in your content. What are what are some of the first steps in improving your brand voice? Mm. So I think the first thing is to really understand what is voice? Like, what do we actually mean by that? It sounds so high-minded. It sounds like something very literary, but essentially all it means is how do you sound when a reader comes to your website, for example, or when they come to your social channels or when they come to the landing page for this podcast? What do your words project to them? Like, what kind of picture do they paint in the mind of that customer or prospect reader who's accessing that material like what what are what are you signaling and so i think just that's flat understanding immediately is just i think we'll we'll just help kind of level set um so sort of the the first thing i think is just being aware of what voice is and the second thing is like just not being afraid of it um and the third thing i would say is that often when we start talking about voice especially for individual communicators or writers marketers those who create content for brands, we think of it as, or the the language around it is around something that we find, right? I need to find my brand voice. Well, I mean, you don't need to find your voice. It's there. (laughs) Your voice is absolutely there. You just need to engage it and, and start practicing it a little bit more. That's the only way that you'll, you'll evolve it. So it's not about finding, it's about evolving. How do you actually think about your brand voice and how do you How do you heighten it so that it is recognizable? So my advice to creators is just, first of all, to just think a little bit about, you know, what are the the ways that you would define your own voice? Like, what are some things about the way you communicate that may be different? 
than those around you. And then just lean into them hard and practice it over time. In the second edition, I talk about a couple of key places where I think it's it's really necessary to think about your your tone of voice um, and from a brand standpoint, especially. So every like think about like the first screen or the first touch for anybody, the first moment that they see your brand. And that's going to vary depending on, you know, sort of how customers come to you. So you have to sort of know that, like you've got to look at your data and figure out how are people accessing how, how are people finding us? So the first screen may be a landing page, maybe a social page, maybe an email. Um, all of those things like pay attention to that first touch. Then pay attention to the greeting in the first email that somebody opens. Um, you know, how are you actually welcoming them to your own assets, right? What are you saying to them? And I just think small signals like that can really go a long way. Um, I mean, there are a couple of other places, but I think it's just it's important to just think through the customer experience and think about those first moments and match your brand voice. Start there as a place to to start instilling your brand and your own voice with a more Eunice. Do you have favorite examples of brands that in those moments do something special with voice? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Uh Sorry, I realized that I was really hot on the mic there. Um, <laughs> you You're really that? excited about brand I voice. I mean, I it's, get real it's, excited it's about telling. brand voice. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, in the book, I talk about one of my favorite examples. And I've been talking about this brand for years, but they still kind of blow me away in terms of how they communicate. Um, it's a company called Freaker, Freaker USA. They sell beverage insulators, essentially little sweaters to put over your cans or bottles of beer or soda or pop, as you might call it, um, something that, that keeps your beverage cold, essentially. Um, and the way that they communicate their, their products and services, the way they communicate with their customers, their prospects, anyone who comes to their social channels or their website or signs up for their email, I mean, it's like, it's so clearly to me uh, a little different, right? The, the way that they signal who they are is just like so wonderful. Are they quirky? Sure. They're super weird. But I think that they take advantage of their differentiation in the market. Like you would never confuse Freaker for say a Yeti. <laughs> you know, Yeti also right. um, produces beverage insulators, but the way that Yeti communicates is very different. That is that's that's a great example, and and you have both sides of it there too, with with uh, the the contrast, and I think that's helpful to see, and and why that that logo test is so telling of oh this could be anybody, but you, you brought up not one but two examples in in a space, but very very different as well. So yeah, and one one of my other favorites, which I'll just mention, is um is the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. And I only mention it because, first of all, it's like it's such a weird example because it's literally a sewer district district. It's a municipal <laughs> organization, right? It's a municipal service. Um, now, I don't live in Northeast Ohio. I don't have a particular interest in municipal sewer services, but the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District is on Twitter. I subscribe to their newsletter. Um they have a podcast. They're also on TikTok. They're on, I think they're on Instagram too, but they do such an amazing job of using their brand voice in a way that differentiates the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. Now, why does it even matter? Because why are they even concerned with this? It's because they use it as a recruiting tool primarily. And I think that's an important distinction here, right? It's not just about getting customers or nurturing customers, but it's also about signaling to potential employees how you're different. Um, and so I like the fact that they are using their voice in interesting ways. And they're not like silly or or crazy, but what they are is very human. And I hate using that word because it's so amorphous and it just doesn't really... I don't know. It just doesn't really capture the the fullness of of what they do there. But I love the way that they are just communicating as people with other people, and it's just so unusual in a from a municipal services company, you know, or, or organization. Um, so it's I think that's another fantastic example of brand voice and using it in a way that's meaningful for 
what you need it to do for you in their case, you know, recruiting and, um, and yeah, to, to do some, I, I guess what they're really doing is highlighting the unseen systems that we see every day. It certainly made me think differently about my own sewer, I mean, sewer company here. <laughs> and why aren't they on Twitter? Why don't they have a newsletter? I really want to find out what's going on in my own town. Um, but, you know, just, just differentiating themselves. I think it's just a fantastic example of something that you wouldn't normally associate with right. voice, unlike a consumer product like Freaker. Yeah. And I think that's another example too, kind of coming full circle. We talked about some of the baggage of, of terrible at writing, terrible at grammar, what it really means. But I also think the, there could be, you know, with, with only an example like Freaker of, okay, that's not me. I'm just a municipal service. So I think seeing these examples of innovative brand voices in interesting uh, industries and spaces is especially valuable. Mm. Well, talking about municipal sewer service makes me smile, but I, I would love to know, Anne, <laughs> about a brand that has made you smile recently. Oh my goodness. I did not know where that question was going. Segway. Yeah. Wow. That was masterful. Hundreds of episodes. Wow. This is why you're in the 440. <laughs> what did you say? Three? Something, yeah, like that. something like that. Oh my goodness. Um. All right. I am going to share something that has not just made me smile, but has literally made me laugh out loud, which I often don't do while I'm watching. I Netflix. prefer not to laugh out loud. I prefer not to laugh out loud. No, it's just like, it's not normally the way that I would watch anything on, um, on, uh, on a streaming service. But I will tell you <laughs> that the show called Kunk on Earth, it is so wonderful. It is so hilarious. It's a mockumentary, which takes us back to basically the very, very beginning of our planet. And through five episodes, which are roughly, oh, I don't know, maybe half an hour long, something like that, maybe 40 minutes. Um, so through five episodes takes us to the present day. It features Diane Morgan, um, an actress playing and, and comic playing this character, Philomena Kunk. And she is, uh, I don't, I can't, it's a mockumentary. It's just, I went into it thinking that this is going to be stupid. I'm just not going to enjoy this, but let me just give this a go because I've heard it from a few people that maybe I would enjoy it. Um, and oh my goodness, I was sold. I have not laughed as much at a show as in probably like just a long time. It's just so fantastic. And I don't want to oversell it. So maybe I should just say it's not that funny, but it's right. extremely yeah, I, enjoyable. I think Malcolm Gladwell would uh, would would sell this show differently. Yeah, but I know. I feel we're... like I'm I'm like signaling it's like seventy two percent funnier. But oh my <laughs> lord, it just you know what the other thing is it needs some love because it's it's so clever and it's so fun and it's really smart. It's not stupid like a lot of mockumentaries can kind of yeah they can they can swerve into that sort of silly ridiculous like right. just dumb you know lane but this one doesn't it it's it is just so smart and it really does deserve a whole lot more love and a whole lot more viewers so if you have not checked out kunk on earth you really should watch it you heard it here first and we're gonna make sure kunk on earth gets the the ann handley bump in uh <laughs> in 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 viewership and where is the best place for people to go to learn more about who you are and what you do? Oh, my goodness. Um, you can go to annhamley.com. There's lots of information about there, as the domain would imply. Uh, <laughs> you can subscribe You can subscribe to my fortnightly newsletter, which is my favorite thing that I do, which is at annhamley.com slash newsletter. Um, and between those two places, I think uh, you'll find lots of info about how to connect with me or learn more. Awesome. Well, we will link up to all of that in our show notes, which folks can always find at onbrandpodcast.com. And thanks for being on brand with us. Oh my gosh, Nick. Thank you so much. I could talk to you for another couple of hours. Well, we'll, we'll have to make that episode seven or, or 800 or something. <laughs> I can only come back every 400. Hours. Right. Exactly. Exactly. We got to, got to clock this, leave them wanting more. I think Malcolm Gladwell, would would sign off on that also. <laughs> on Brand is part of the Marketing Podcast Network. 
If you like what you're hearing, if we've made you smile, you can always listen free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite platform may be. And please take a moment and rate and review the podcast to help others find the show. Until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.